Vianne. Hey, Kenya. Hi, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Cold. I see we're both in both jackets. Yeah, jackets. Yes. <laughs> the summer weather is over. I hope. <laughs> yes, I guess it's a good thing that it's over because it was way too hot. And it's uh, if this is any indication of the future, I want to move back north. <laughs> up north. Because <laughs> it is too hot. So... Anyhow, today we are talking about the dynamic duo, no, not Batman and Robin, um, <laughs> product managers and human-centered researchers. And so when we talk about human-centered researchers, we are talking about the gamut of customer discovery, user experience researchers, human factors, psychologists and professionals. So all of those folks that are focused on the human. I thought it was important for us to make to, to make that blanket or to use that blanket statement rather than just saying user experience researchers, because there are people who come out of anthropology programs and other programs that don't necessarily call themselves user experience professionals, but they are just as helpful in that process, that discovery, that validation process, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So let's jump into our topic. So first things first, the I sent out our newsletter this week, and if you are not receiving our newsletter, please subscribe, go to my LinkedIn profile, and you'll see right under my picture, you'll see a link to sign up for the newsletter. In our newsletter this week, we talked about all of the money that is dropped on features that are rarely or never used in products. And it it's not in the millions. The crazy thing is, it's almost 20 not, well, it's over 29.5 billion. So almost 30 billion with a B dollars are spent on product features within software that are either rarely used or not at all. And so when I think about that, like I look back at my career and all of the work that we've done um, in as a green user experience or human-centered design professional, I can think about those projects that we worked on where we did all this work to, to yep. get things right. And those might have been the wrong set of features. Yep. Yep. Well, I think we've all had that happen, right? Even when we have some experience under our belt. Uh, yeah. And I know we both have a lot, lot of examples. You know, I, I always flash back to the one that's that kind of that practice management, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. cloud-based software, cloud-based solution I've worked on. And, that, you know, we we spent a year, year and a half on many, many features. We had people mm -hmm. dedicated to features. We, even me, I thought, you know, as well, based on, you know, coming in, they, they might work. We hadn't really introduced a regular uh, process in there from a UCD or UX perspective. And um, none of them were used and we yeah. weren't getting subscribers and you know but everything seemed like the next greatest thing without the right kind of uh validation uh testing of those assumptions data yeah. going into making those decisions so yeah it's that's always fun to waste you know three four sprint cycles on the feature and then oh never get touched <laughs> and and that's that's the crazy part is that so you you made a you made a really good um, call out by saying even when you were not early in your career, this has happened throughout our career, and I think that that's the important part. The key to all of that is product management leaders or decision makers who are calling shots around the feature set that needs to be included in a product, but the work wasn't done to validate are those the highest priority, right feature set. Is that what your customer really sees in terms of value in your product? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. right implementation. Uh, you know, you and can right have a feature and depending on kind of how True. that feature is incorporated and presented, uh, a useful thing might fall to the wayside. So that's a very yep. good point because you can you might get the feature set right, but the implementation or the way those things are translated from an experiential standpoint into what the product does and how it does things might be off. Yes. Yeah. And I know we both have a lot of examples. Uh, yes. You know, you know, of that. And 
yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to refer back to the one since I just mentioned that kind of practice management. It, you know, there wasn't, in fairness, there wasn't a, a UX team um, initially. Mm -hmm. So you were dependent on the product managers who, mm -hmm. who have sometimes uh, certain views or they don't have the bandwidth or they don't mm -hmm. have the expertise to understand, you know, it's not just a matter of presenting it and someone nodding their head. Yeah, that'd be great. We're going to yeah. hear that a lot. Um, it's really a matter of all those other activities uh, yes. you and I have discussed. We were constantly discussing, um, even on here. But you know that they say yes to a lot of things, or you misinterpret what they say is a a problem may not be the actual mm -hmm. problem. And again, going back to the example I used, there was a really, really, really heavy emphasis, and I know um, we'll probably talk about allocating resources, but there was a really heavy emphasis on one aspect of the solution um, that that intuitively kind of made sense. You know, well, mm -hmm. they need to manage all these assets. Of course, they need to build people. Well, you know, we'll get to all that. But, you know, we right. really need to get the core set up of the managing office documents, managing calendars, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, turned out what they really wanted was the billing component That's which right. we prioritized how do we find out um scrubbing support logs <laughs> you know doing uh just observing going in mm -hmm. and observing people uh but in the end with when pairing with but there was still a little bit of i don't want to call it tension but disagreement with product mm -hmm. management and so in this case what we did was a lean test we Mm -hmm. We put uh, different marketing messages. So we put two different marketing messages out there. Um, mm -hmm. we careful with kind of not showing exactly what it was and being clear, hey, sign up for a beta. Um, looking at kind of one direction of the billing and the other, which product management wanted to go in, the kind of document, calendaring, all that, let's tackle that first. And mm -hmm. what we found was not a little difference of even people on searches we let run a while. Um, the messaging for the billing, what was it? I think it got, like, we're talking about 200 times, you heard me mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. more clicks and these sign-ups for, hey, well, let me know then the direction we were going in and actually wow. had almost all our sprint teams dedicated well it was all the <laughs> sprint teams and uh the long-term roadmap dedicated to these other yeah. teams. um so it was a really quick test to find out direction and priorities and what people were looking for mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so that's one of my favorite because it was so easy in terms of identifying that mm -hmm. and so clear cut well I easy think. but also cheap like efficient cheap i think it's we efficient. we the only thing we paid for were google ads um you know to mm -hmm. make sure we and the domains did you have to pay for don't special domain we, we we had a kind of sandbox testing area so okay we, given it was it was okay. somewhat of a faking it um but that's part of lean sometimes uh, yeah, yeah. Out so but lean yeah. testing is a really good um example of where product management can learn from or utilize the capabilities of a human-centered yeah. researcher and in the story you just told what what really really stands out to me is if i was to ask the question watching this of how do I go back to my boss and tell them why we need to work with human-centered researchers? The key is that research piece. And as researchers, we are versed in different methods that allow us to figure out what are we trying to get answers to? What method do we pull out of our toolkit? And that's the value of being a human-centered researcher with that those, those research chops is knowing all of those different methods. We have had courses in experimentation and methods and survey tools, which goes a long way when you get to a point where you're saying, okay, we have a specific question to ask and you can't throw the same focus group, regular survey out to the masses. 
to get your answers. Right. And what stage are you in? I'm actually thrilled you brought that up because that wasn't the end of that story. That just said, okay, pit product management definitely was on board. You know, like, mm -hmm. yep, we got to completely shift gears. You know, we've got the teams, we've got the skills. Uh, but now we had to go that next stage. Like, what exactly? I, I won't go there yet. <laughs> but, or should I? I mean, I don't Absolutely. Know. Jump right want. in. Um, but so then the next task was, okay, we know now what our core competency should be for this product mm -hmm. if we want people to buy and subscribe. Mm -hmm. So the next, you know, the next thing, re reach into your pocket, what do we, what do we need to do? It's what does that mean? So mm -hmm. the, the, again, pairing up with product management who was immediately going to go into we need to capture time and create invoices. Yeah, mm -hmm. but what does that mean? You know, what what does it mean? Is that the biggest priority? Is that what they're going to be using? And mm -hmm. so the next stage of testing was going on sites, watching how people were working. Mm -hmm. We already had, uh, you know, kind of story set mm -hmm. up where the focus mm -hmm. was on the person billing, mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. we'll call it the timekeeper. So everything was around time and expense entries and invoicing. Makes sense, right? They want billing that resonated the most. Well, it turned out everyone had QuickBooks. <laughs> so we uh, really dug deeper. The need wasn't right when they found out you, you weren't playing nice with it, which would have been an entire effort on its own and needed uh, to be we're not going to use it anyway. So, you know, if we had just run from the one method, like yeah. now we know where they want us to focus and run with assumptions that we all had, to be honest, that we're going to, it's probably time and expense and invoicing, but let's do product management. Right. Agreed. Let's do that next level uh, of to figure out what does that look like? And again, we had data that showed because we did go down the path. We got to get the time and expense. We got to get the invoices. And then it showed that 80% weren't using it, even though we'd seen that huge swing on that search. What well, turned out it was all about QuickBooks. <laughs> you know, when you're not uh, we're integrating with QuickBooks. Um, and, and we should have known that by being on site. And we were too focused on one person in that workflow so we had made assumptions mm -hmm. about the actual journey in that workflow analysis was that that main timekeeper was mm -hmm. the one who was going to be entering his or her time you know so that one job was the focus. and that was wrong and, and that was wrong <laughs> and through going on site yeah we noticed that no it's all the administrators trying to recreate all this time because mm -hmm. they are the ones actually they have the most pain pulling it together. Yeah. Yes, so, they have the most because they're going through uh, digital timers. They're going through legal pads that have calendars. Calendar. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when you talk about that, the interesting thing is, is observational work requires more than just looking at what's on the surface. You've got to understand how to interpret those behaviors. And I feel like this is where your human centered researchers have a unique capability from coming from their experience and training to know what to look for and more importantly where to probe around those different behaviors or or dynamics that you see going going on or at play um i went to a conference recently and had a couple of people that i used to work with who were in product management who were product managers themselves come up to me and say you know I learned how to perform or conduct discovery activities through you. Yes. And it came from either telling them and showing them. So let's go through it, practice, then let's go out into the field and, you know, practice again. You try it. I give you feedback. And so when I think about that, there's a really important component of not assuming that you just know how to do it because you read about it. Yes. Yeah, and, and that brings up the whole partnership aspect, too, with product management, right. because you can end up in more of a, uh, um, you know, kind of a head-butting mode, a little bit of tension 
because product management feels like they own it. They feel like sometimes you're coming in with your research and mm -hmm. encroaching on their space. Exactly. They should own. So, you know, that whole point you mentioned about that the partnerships was important, mm -hmm. gaining that trust of of whoever your stakeholders are mm -hmm. product management executive leadership and then partnering with them so that they see that value that they can do it themselves too mm -hmm. when they're going out in the field product managers and from the customers all the time um so i always made an effort we would do either i'd come along with them on visits and kind of structure you know mm -hmm. what here here let's let's kind of go at this in a little more controlled discipline you know mm -hmm. way and bring them in on the usability test Absolutely. let them sit in on the testing uh we do that today with all of our clients uh you know join go on mute you know yes. um but but join watch feel the pain hear the feedback directly not just looking at our powerpoint presentation it goes That's a right. long way of trust too you've got to gain that trust and that trust piece is is huge i feel like it also gets them to understand in subsequent uh aspects of the roadmap or projects mm -hmm. they now look at what they use to inform decisions Yes. And when they get to points where there's a lack of clarity, where they need answers, there is now a, a context around, let me pull in my partner. Let me pull in my, yeah, let me pull in my partner who knows what tool to pull out of their toolkit. And again, yes. the key is that your researcher or researchers are not one trick ponies. You cannot expect someone who has one method or one approach to be the one that's going to provide you with this guidance, assistance, and partnership. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, yep. so you've got to make sure that you have the right set of people, but also that you have the time available to exercise whatever is needed to yeah. in terms of formative work or summative work. Yes. You know, and you can make product managers a lot more confident. You know, mm -hmm. when Absolutely. they have that data kind of backing them, they have that partner who's with them saying, no, we, we all kind of believe Absolutely. this and here's why. So you, you have a, an extra layer of confidence when you've got, you know, your long term strategic mm -hmm. roadmap. You don't, mm -hmm. you know, want to fall on your face after you know, millions of dollars in development. So mm -hmm. um I uh, had an experience with a product manager who was asserting requirements for a new product. Mm -hmm. There were no concepts created. There was just that product manager's evidence of what was necessary in terms of this new offering or this new application. And what happened as a result was there was a lot of churn within the dev team, the UX team, because people could not wrap their heads around, what are you asking us to create and build? Right. What, what is this? And so, and there was also that, that point where you asked the right questions to the product manager and there was no evidence. It was, well, I think, or, you know, we should do it this way, but there was nothing to stand behind that. That's right. a concern. When you get to that place where you're making assertions based on your own assumptions or things don't have evidence to stand behind them and they're not data informed, that's mm -hmm. when you should raise your hand and say, hey, where are my partners? Let's go figure this out. So in that particular project, we carved out six weeks. Let's go visit with a handful of strategic customers and let's talk to them about what they're doing today. What tools are they using? What tools? Yeah. And where do they feel that they have the biggest challenges or gaps? Okay. We came back and that product manager was now able to craft a story, a literal, like, let's create a newspaper write-up about this circumstance or situation that this persona or archetype was experiencing. And that product manager revealed that to the team and shared out this story and people were able to start crystallizing what it is that, that the product manager was talking about. Mm -hmm. And then immediately from that, the, the interaction designer was able to crank out some concepts to then give people a picture of here's the dashboard, here are the mm -hmm. objects you work with. 
you know, here are the goals that someone's trying to achieve in this application. And so from there, things kind of took off in terms of requirements definition, sizing efforts, dev understanding foundational technologies. So yeah. it accelerated the process greatly by just carving out that six weeks yeah. to go and, like you said, observe and talk to customers. Yeah. And that, and that, that probably that partnership probably mm -hmm. helped with the rest of the team. It's kind of this, this clear picture. They develop a little, you know, some of that empathy, which mm -hmm. Absolutely. in terms of making those decisions, bringing up those concerns, you know, concerns now that they have a little bit of empathy and it does, it, it can kind of change the culture of the teams in terms of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I and just team always, yes, exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think you, UX or what, whatever this human, the, the people focus on the human, but focus on the user experience aspect of things should also, uh, another key part of that partnership to me, especially long-term partnerships mm -hmm. is, you know, what UXers have a roadmap where you're coordinating yes. your activities with the, yes. the product roadmap. So that kind of the research forces, roadmap, product roadmap. Yes. And that kind of forces also mm -hmm. or, or brings together that collaboration as well, because you're always on the same page and you're always staying ahead. Um, you know, you're 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 ahead. You're doing that iterative. Mm -hmm iterative testing before things are landing in, in yeah. development. Yeah. And, you know, you just put up there, sure, appropriate resource allocation. Well, if you get ahead and you're doing that testing and going back to that billing thing, you can imagine QuickBooks integration was a beast. You mm -hmm. have 75% of your, uh, your, your uh, teams, your development teams, sprints dedicated to something mm -hmm. unrelated. Bring that all together and then start allocating all the resources uh, yes. correctly so you know what it's really 25 should be on that and 75 should be yes. on that. And, and and us too how do we allocate our resources well we need a roadmap too to know what's coming up mm -hmm. um you know that we're all on the same page and how do we get ahead of it so uh same thing we all absolutely yeah. and you know a big a big challenge i think a lot of organizations or a big um a situation that a lot of organizations put themselves in is thinking okay i can't afford these researchers or i'm concerned that they won't be fully allocated throughout the whole year and what i've seen is with some of our clients and when we were in-house what i've seen is situations where there was downtime that just because of that resource allocation challenge and understanding how do I fully utilize this person's skill set yes. or I don't know how. Mm -hmm. So what I've seen is, you know, as a as a, an outside consultant now, as a business partner, I feel like that it's such a, a much more effective engagement to be able to go into the organization to prescribe, but also to partner on defining what activities are going to be performed, how are you going to go about doing them? This is what they should cause, the timeline, all that sort of thing. Being able to then execute and deliver on those things. I have to say that honestly, in my experience now, um, as a consultant, I have seen 100% returns with mm -hmm. every client that we've engaged. There have been 100% returns in terms mm -hmm. of gaining clarity, um, resource allocation and optimization, or yes. understanding what the teams are supposed to be doing, which then allowed for improved collaboration within their organization and teaming. I have not seen one instance where the work around that clarity up front yep. or that discovery up front did not help those aspects of the organization in a project. Yes. And I think we, you and I, have a very, 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 very recent experience with that. And this isn't a bad or good, but coming in and when it's not aligned, so you kind of have, uh, you're not partnering with your UX, whether it be design or research or mm -hmm. whatever it is, you're not partnering with them. You're just kind of, um, they don't have insight into this roadmap. They don't have insight, that, let alone input that maybe they should have. Uh, but where where 
there is that disconnect. And we had one where we went in and they've been working, it sounded like for months and months and months with the UX mm -hmm. team trying to get their next iteration of their product out there. And it was at an absolute standstill. And I, I believe yeah. it and correct me if I'm wrong, it had been seven, eight months at complete yeah. standstill. Things weren't even clearly defined. Where do we yeah. want to go with this? So go in, do the research, obviously, to get that clarity. But working, you know, partnering with that UX team, mm -hmm. it's us kind of being in between with product management and the UX mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. bringing them together a little bit for the first time to make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. Everyone's seeing the data. Um, and conducting those activities with everyone involved, the user interviews, prototype testing, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to brag about us for a brief moment that it went from that to what, what, eight weeks? Yeah. Eight weeks. Yeah. Testing was done. Yeah. Um, features prioritized or identified in this case that what we, what, going back to what we said earlier, they were, you were chasing the wrong challenge and pain point. It yes. Out. And a prototype for the next round of, you know, high level iterative testing to mm -hmm. dig into the next level of what that mm -hmm. should be. But all of a sudden, when everyone was on the same page, hearing the same things, agreeing on what we were hearing, mm -hmm. it accelerated. And now that development and UX team got it. And, yes. within and they're on the same page. Huh? Yes. And they're on the same page. And they're on the same page and actually turned out, you know, in a matter of a week and a half, I think, on the first prototype that does, mm -hmm. after eight months of really not much of anything. Mm -hmm. um, so, you but know. how many times have I've seen that so many times throughout so my career? Times. And people, do not i can recall a project where the team was trying to create automated test cases but mm -hmm. couldn't figure out what, what to, to automate test. because there was right what to test so digging into that and kind of asking why and trying to understand it went back to the fact that there was no clear understanding of the customer's goals right of right. the customer's product use to then use that to define requirements yeah. that would then decompose and become what frames the test cases. They consume, yeah. And 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 I it it just it fascinates me to see where it always goes back to that clarity up front and that understanding of the customer and their goals and their motivations and their their jobs and that sort yeah. of thing that make a world of difference in the team's activities and their output. Yes. Something that something that we didn't mention was also, so this doesn't always require the need to go out and talk to customers. Right. Think about how every single one of our projects start. They start with a heuristic evaluation. Yes. We talked about this on a previous every session. Time. An expert evaluation of the existing product or service. And there's so much that you can uncover that then feeds into the product roadmap and can help to prioritize. Okay, let's triangulate this with support calls or analytics that we have around usage. Yep. And you can then use that data together to figure out, is this something that is high priority, needs to be addressed? Okay, now that we know it is, let's put that researcher on figuring out what that answer looks like. What does right. that solution experience look like? Right. Yep, and partner with that again goes back to that PM knowing when to say what well, we need to partner with, we need to validate some of this, or we need to dig another layer deep, you know, mm -hmm. um, in that iterative kind of process. Yes. Yes. And again, as, as you say this, and as we talk through this, what it reminds me of is research activities we performed when in graduate school research activities that we've performed throughout our lives that don't relate to a software development organization or a service development organization, but that relate to just core fundamental research practices. Yes. When you look to, to you define your hypothesis and then go and to get the evidence to support or refute that hypothesis, what do you do once you get that information? 
you then determine what direction do I go in from there? Yes. The process. Yes. It, it really is the same process. Just yeah, it, different uh, situation or environment, mm -hmm. maybe, but it's the same process. Different you intended outcomes. Your hypothesis, you got to test and validate those assumptions. You and a lot of times that'll you'll glean something new um, right. from that <laughs> for right. the next level. But yeah, definitely. And and the the key is that you don't want to miss some of those hidden gems in that data. And that's where your expertise is needed. It's to find those hidden gems that are embedded within that data that don't just jump out at you. Right. Yep. It, yep. Exactly. And understanding the why behind some of those things. Right. That is where you need your human centered researcher because that is truly hum human subject research. Right. And, and and not only validating, so a lot of people, a lot of times there's this perception of failure. If you go mm -hmm. out to test your assumptions or validate an idea and mm -hmm. like, oh, it didn't resonate or it doesn't address people, whatever it may be. Not failed. Be, that's right. not a failure. That's saving you millions of dollars and potential loss of customers by going in the right direction. And a lot of times you'll actually uncover in those activities the right direction. So yeah. so not only have you determined, maybe my assumptions were off, but within those, it might go, here's what your assumption should have been. <laughs> you know, yeah. here's what the problem is. And again, we've had that happen um, numerous times with clients where, where we do come in, mm -hmm. honed in and focus on one area. Uh, and it turns out that's, not the problem at all you know you, you're, mm -hmm. you're going to spend a whole lot of effort money you're going to allocate resources to something that's not going to move the needle for you yes um, and and but here's what will you know you think your problem is this in the ui and we need to update the ui and all this fun stuff um when in reality no, you need a whole new feature set because mm -hmm. the biggest pain point you don't even address at all. Uh, so I think product management back to that partnership needs to understand the goal when we're validating or testing assumptions is not to prove you wrong. And there's nothing wrong with being wrong. Um, it's to prevent right. you from losing money and not capturing market share, you know, out there. Absolutely. Or to uncover what the real problem is. So absolutely. Uh, and that's the key is that what you just said, I think, is a real nugget around. It's not failure. The, it's not it's, clar it's clarity. It's yeah. clarity on what it is not. Now you want to focus on what is it and what how do we now pivot or shift our focus? to those things that are within our core competencies that we want to chase, that we want right. to pursue, right. that maybe we didn't know before. And that's where I think a lot of organizations that come to us are open and progressive enough to, uh, to, to be willing to hear those things mm -hmm. that come out of the work that were um, unexpected, but to also then say, okay, how do we how do we do the work to figure out how to turn this into a solution? Exactly. That is the key. It's, and it's that's not, the hard part. Sometimes. That's the hardest part. And that's where you still need to do more research. Mm -hmm. Right. You are not done. It's like likening. If you think about the move to electric vehicles, you first discover that fossil fuel powered vehicles is no longer the answer. Now we realize it's electric vehicles. Okay. Now that we know it's electric vehicles, what does that mean? Now we've got to figure out that feature set for those vehicles, the componentry that's necessary, but that requires some level of investigation and research to do that. Yes. Same thing. We yes. have to look at it the same way in terms of new innovation that might, it's still a car. It still has a <laughs> steering wheel and pedals, but we've got to think about how those things work differently now that we know it's a completely different model and how you power that vehicle. Right. Exactly. I keep going back, yeah, to the Ford guy. You know, they knew yes. they knew they need an electric vehicle, but no one had kind of uh, 
gone through that user journey. It was already, right. they already had a $125,000 truck out there right. uh, before they actually you know, tried to go through uh, that journey and see all the other features or experiences mm -hmm. that were going to mm -hmm. impact people mm -hmm. buying the vehicle um, and being your, your, your promoter versus detractor, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So, and, and, and what you just said, what the most important part of that, that learning was starting with the user journey of getting, going through a trip or getting from point A to point B, mapping out that journey first, and then looking for those points where now that this is no longer a gas powered vehicle, how does that journey change? Where do we inject new capabilities? Yes. What are the things external to the vehicle that are needed to keep it moving forward and getting to that destination? That is where the, this, that is research. I, exactly. That is really research. Exactly. And I, I like that example because uh, again, uh, I think where you researchers, skilled researchers come into to play well is taking that holistic look at things and i'll mm -hmm. give another software example another product um i worked on we worked on actually but it was you know there was this big focus on how to create these processes with a tool um mm -hmm. very complicated very very complicated so just focusing on how do you how do you build it how does the end user build that process and configure mm -hmm. it and all that fun stuff you want to make it easy because it's supposed to be for non-technical users. So uncovered all the things that might make it a little quirky or a difficult, low adoption rate. But what it turned out was it wasn't all about that initial creation. It was about the maintenance and the pain yeah. points that came after it. And, yeah. and there's been this complete focus on the rightfully so initially. Mm -hmm. um, on the tool itself, you know, how are you going to, you know, drag pieces of this process and move things all mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. So we can make that easier. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that wasn't the big pain point. It, they, the thinking was that's why people aren't using it. That's why people mm -hmm. aren't adopting mm -hmm. it. And it turned out, no, that's not why. It's because they tried it one time or used it one time and then to maintain it, there was, it was so cumbersome and so much mm -hmm. breakage without systems letting people know mm -hmm. where they might be breaking. They, that was why they weren't using yes, it. And that was point. a major assumption. Yeah. That was a complete shift in what should you be honed oh, in on. Yes, um, what you focus yeah. on. And that's, that's oh, a really, I think that's a really important point to make is there are different goals that people have in that overall workflow or the need to use that tool for them to get something done. The creation sub goal is one, one. The maintenance and update and, and usage is another. Mm -hmm. and so when you think about that, there is a, a body of work that needs to be done around that creation process or a focus around that. And then a secondary focus around the maintenance and usage process. And I right. think that we have to, again, look at it as research and understand that mental model shifts occur in the creation process versus the other. And we understand that as researchers, lay people who are not research oriented, and we're not saying that researchers are the only ones that think this way, right. but we've been trained to think in that way. And so as a product manager, you have so many different balls in the air. Why not partner with someone who can help augment, facilitate, drive, and help define those aspects that you can then consume yes. and manage across your whole, you know, your whole plethora of responsibilities as a product manager? Yes. Yes. And they <laughs> are spread then. You know, product management teams are absolutely I've always been spread then, you know. They've got a lot of things, a lot of things are juggling and it's, it's a relief once they establish that partnership and mm -hmm. trust it. So for UXers out there, you, ha you have to demonstrate things that'll create that trust. Um, mm -hmm. And that know, are of value. Of value. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so it frees them up to do some of the other fun stuff, you know, good stuff they need to yes. do to 
gain those new clients, sell that product, move yeah. that, that needle. Uh, definitely. Yep. Yeah. And, and there's so many teams, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, these larger organizations, they don't, they're so siloed, but mm -hmm. they don't have those opportunities. They get very honed in mm -hmm. on whatever they're working on when, when other areas may impact them due to complexity mm -hmm. of product or just a silo of teams. And um, I know I interrupted you, but mm -hmm. that that's another place that can help yeah, the team understand, yeah, who I need to be working with. I think, you know, printer subscriptions, focus mm -hmm. on um, kind of that connection piece. You know, you had hardware, you had software, you had marketing yes. messages. Well, you know, the team working on the actual software to do it, they're very focused on, okay, you come in, you test, we need to know, is this prototype working? We were like, that's great, but can we test? We have the time, the complete flow of a person mm -hmm. finding out about you, reading about it, then signing up, and then doing that. So that whole journey from that awareness whole journey to great. Mm -hmm. It was broken all along the way. Yeah. So, I mean, through yeah. our testing, we found out what hardware team had done with spitting out the exact opposite of what mm -hmm. the software team was saying. So you could be looking at a web page saying this, your printer shoots out something telling you this. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a marketing message that I think we had 80% said we made them you know go through the process but 80 percent said no i quit here i don't understand this and this doesn't resonate with me absolutely 100 percent, no 90 percent failure rate on that hardware piece so again we couldn't even get to we did get to the prototype because it was a prototype mm -hmm. but by doing that it made this team start communicating and updating with marketing yes. Like, and it made them, okay, now we've got to leverage requirements and work with the hardware team to change this. That happened, mm -hmm. came in, and we went from a 90% reporting that they would abandon. Oh, no, that was a task failure. 80% mm -hmm. said they'd abandon based on marketing. We made them keep going on the messaging. 90% mm -hmm. failed the task because of the hardware issue the contradiction in messages with the hardware and the software. Mm -hmm. We stopped the testing and said, yes. hey, we already can tell you, you got the problem. Yes. And then quick tweets, I think in three days, came back with the prototype, went from a 90% failure rate to 100% success rate. On the marketing messaging side, just by tweaking that in the prototype, like got off the live site, we suddenly only had 20% say, eh, that doesn't work. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, this little thing. It's and all of that, <laughs> yeah. Then they didn't release that. They were about to develop and release it. They stopped. They got all that fixed. And then they released it. Yeah, oh, that's huge. And you think was, about that the investment. Huge. But you think about the investment that was made and the work that we did. It's so small, small. in the grand scheme of what they st stood to lose in terms of adoption and usage, mm -hmm. but also the technical challenges that we uncovered in that work. All of that together, you know, I feel like we undercharged <laughs> because it's just like. <laughs> I mean, but you think, about that how huge, you, yeah, you think about how huge that is in terms of all of that insight that came out of our work. And it's a fraction of what you see in terms of the loss that you experience if yeah. you don't address these things. Yeah. So yeah. hey, we have like less than a minute yeah. left. If I was to give one or three, I should say, takeaways to our audience, I would say that the urgency behind working with human-centered researchers, the three things that you want to think about and go take away from this is the, the assurance that you're going to define the correct feature set. You want to make sure that the things that you are defining as the features of focus are the right set for your customer or do your learnings and insights tell you that they are something else 
and you get ahead of them before development. So we're the ounce of prevention ahead of kickoff. We make sure that you've got that right feature set, but once you do, ensuring that you create that correct implementation around those requirements, and finally, making sure that you allocate resources appropriately. You've got the right people doing the right jobs within your organization. You can create KPIs around what they're doing, yeah. and everyone is happy and excited about what they're doing because they feel like they're purposeful and have trust for one another. Yeah. Yeah. So we are over time. Dr. Mm. Dan, it was wonderful catching up today yeah. and having this conversation. I will see you next week. And to our audience, have an awesome week and take care and be safe. Bye. Bye.